I've given a lot of thought on how I'm going to introduce this next speaker, but I, I don't think I have the words because, I mean, he's one of my greatest friends. We made Skepticon together. We sing Tenacious D in my car together. It, he's awesome. He's just amazing. And I don't, JT, I know I'm probably messing this whole thing up, but I love you and I'm glad you're speaking here at Skepticon and rock it, man. JT Everhard. I'll try not to fuck this up. Hi. There's a lot of you out there. I don't think I'm going to give a talk. I'm just going to sit here and let you guys yell things. Um, starters. This thing is free. And that's really impressive. It's run by a student group. A lot of work goes into this. I'm fully aware of that. And whenever we have a baby or a pet project, like Skepticon was for me, it's always so hard to let go of it. And this, the group that's taken it over, Katie Hartman, Blythe, Lauren, Rob, Ryan, and everybody else involved, has turned it into something I never dreamed it could have been. And I want you guys to stand up and give them a round of applause, because they're fantastic. <laughs> Now sit down, we're running late. <laughs> um, my name is JT Eberhard. I work for an organization called the Secular Student Alliance in Columbus, Ohio. And there are some SSA groups in the house. If you guys haven't filled out your affiliation renewals for this semester, do that, please. Um, I was also asked to give a, a brief plug for Reason Fest, the SOMA group in Lawrence at KU. <laughs> who makes up about half the audience. Uh, they're running that in February. I'm going to be speaking there and doing a debate. Um, Skepticon created a wave of free conferences run by student groups, and those is one of the best out there. If you're in the region, seriously consider going. Um, also a plug for weareatheism.com. I'm going to talk a little bit about coming out of the closet, and if, it's, it's such an important thing. Uh, check out their website. Um, I also, everyone's been asking me to sing all weekend. I'm going to sing one more thing. Uh, Gail Jordan. Uh, is here from Tennessee, uh, and it was her birthday yesterday, along with Deanie from, this, from the same group. Um, so we're going to sing happy birthday to Gail and Deanie. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Gail and Deanie. Happy birthday to you. Thank you for that. Happy birthday, guys. Um, when I got asked to come back and speak at Skepticon this year, um, I, after doing uh, an immediate and inappropriate dance in public, because I was so excited, uh, <laughs> uh, I started thinking about what I was going to talk about. Last year, I gave a talk called Dear Christian, uh, in which I, t I talked about the previous year of my life and how to, I had attended church and gotten to hear some of the rancid arguments religious people use when you don't stand up and pray with them. Um, and it was a good talk. But our movement is evolving. The way we approach things is changing. And to come in here and, and do a talk on how to beat a bunch of religious arguments isn't really something we need anymore. I mean, you guys know how to beat the first cause argument. You know how to beat the fine-tuning argument. Uh, and if you don't, uh, there are people who do it a lot better than me. Buy Richard Carrier's book, Sense and Goodness Without God. It's, it's a manual for that stuff. Um, so the topic I eventually wound up on was mental illness. And I decided on this talk because it's a way I can have a chance at changing the minds of everybody in the audience. So whereas I, I, I didn't need to tell everybody how to beat religious arguments, I really think I can get to everybody here in some way. 
The most recent numbers tell us that either 22 or 23 percent of Americans have a mental disorder of some kind. So I'm looking down in the front row right now. I count 14 people. Four of them have, probably have a mental disorder. Extrapolate that back through this entire house. Watch a football game. One of the offensive linemen has a mental disorder. He has fame, he has money, he has the respect of millions, and he has a mental disorder. Probably something that leads to some kind of depression. And so, I'm talking to all of you in the audience who have a mental disorder, because a lot of them don't know what to do with it. They don't know that they can live a life that is somewhat close to normalcy. And I'm talking to the rest of them because those people need you. This is an invisible disability that ends lives. Of all the mental illnesses, anorexia, which happens to be my little baby, um, has the highest death rate of any mental illness. And it's higher than a lot of other conditions that are not relegated strictly to the mind. The myths and ignorance about mental illness touch all of us. And which is why it was so important for me to come in here and talk to you guys about this. Now, in Des Moines this year at the American Atheist uh, National Convention, I gave a talk called Coming Out Skeptical, uh, with the title borrowed with permission from John Corvino, in which I talked about the importance of coming out of the closet as atheists for a number of reasons. Someone may think that atheists are all evil, but they may not think their son is evil, or their brother, or their parents. It's a way we normalize the things that are uh, burdened by stigma. And it's a way we make the world a better place. And it's a, it's a tremendous power that's available to all of us that isn't actually even available to Richard Dawkins himself. And I realized in May of this year that by not coming out about my mental illness, that I was being a hypocrite. And that's a pretty shitty way to live life. Most of you who know me know I'm a very happy person. Most people who have mental illnesses are. Which is why it's such a problem. There's no pain telling you you're sick. There's uh, nothing generally hinting to the people around you that something's wrong. So it's something we need to know to look out for. So I'm going to take the first half of my talk and try to put a bit of a face on mental illness by explaining what it's been like for me. Bear with me. How many people have insecurities about their body? And freaking all of us. And I did too growing up. And I thought it was no different than, I was no different than anybody else. And then I started feeling subtle changes to my life. Everywhere I went, I didn't enter the room looking for other human beings. I entered the room looking for reflective surfaces, you know, a mirror, a puddle, you know, something where I could just look at myself, not because I was shocked about what I would see, but just hoping that it would have changed somehow. And this began to dominate every facet of my life. I couldn't speak to somebody about the weather or about video games or about Skepticon uh, without this just being the predominant thing on my mind. And I started to drip, drift out of conversations because I couldn't think about anything else. And after that, everything started to affect me in, in very odd ways. I, I couldn't see other human beings without being just convinced that no matter what, they didn't want to be around me, not because I was obnoxious, not because I lacked social grace, but because they just didn't want to look at me. Which, looking back now, is just fucking stupid. But that's the thing about mental illness, is it takes away your ability to reason at times. And you don't even know it. And so, how, did, how do you beat this? How do you beat the fact that every time you go out into public, something sets you off into a panic? Because you don't want to be a burden to anybody else around you. You don't want to be a burden to your friends. Do you just gut it out? I tried. Uh, Lauren, 
was here when I went to school. So many of my friends are. I tried to get out of the house. I tried to go hang out with friends. And I would do it for a few hours at a time, at most, and then make up some excuse to leave, just because I couldn't stand being out of my house. And eventually, I just stopped leaving unless I was dragged out. It got to the point where it was on my mind so much that I had to do something to fix it. And so I stopped eating. I started weighing myself you know, double-digit times a day. And it was the best feeling in the world to just look at the scale and see that I'd lost you know, two-tenths of a pound or three-tenths of a pound. And it didn't make things better outside of my house, but it gave me just a few seconds of not having this on my mind and of thinking, yeah, I'm a firebrand. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> ah. And it didn't fix what was going on outside, but it gave me a brief reprieve, which was pretty swell. And it told me that maybe if I just kept losing enough weight, this whole problem would get fixed. And it never did. It's kind of the nature of the beast with that. But my friends started to notice that I wasn't hanging out as much. And they tried everything from interventions to dragging me over to their house and cooking for me you know, and just throwing food in front of me. And the thing is, you know, to an anorexic, it's not as simple as just picking the food up and putting it in your mouth and chewing. It's like jumping out of an airplane. You know, you know that you're safe. You know there's virtually no chance this can go wrong. And you just can't make yourself do it because your brain's telling you that this is death. This is that, that reprieve you get every time you weigh yourself. This is going to take it away from you. You know, my friends told me, uh, my friend Amber told me, by not eating, your body's eating away at your organs and it's eating away at the brain you kind of need. You should probably start eating. But to the anorexic, it's not about being healthy. You can't say, you know, not eating is keeping you from being healthy. Because we don't care. We don't care if we're healthy. We don't care if we're trimming away years off of our life. We just care that people can look at us. So there's no real motivation to eat there. And the stupid thing about conditions like this is you start to become attached to them. You know, that, that moment when you weigh yourself every day is the best time of your day. And any time someone says, you need to get rid of this condition, you need to change this, they're, to the anorexic, they're trying to take that away from you. And you, to your friends, you get, this, you get this attitude of how dare you try to take this away from me. And it traps you. I had a friend tell me before I came up here, quote unquote, you're going to be a pussy, aren't you? <laughs> and I swore that I wouldn't. And I lied. <laughs> Atheist, no moral compass. <laughs> uh. I, have, I had really good friends in college and they put up with a lot. They could have abandoned me and been totally justified. It was years of trying to get me better. Until finally, Amber, who was a psychology student at the time, um, dragged me, almost literally kicking and screaming to the doctor uh, to get put on medication. Um, and the thing is, I thought that it was my fault. And I was trying so hard to force myself to be better. So I, I, I really, I thought it was a flaw of my character. And if, to me, if I took medication, that means I failed. You know, and I was weak in some way. 
Thankfully, Ember was having none of that shit. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> and she even went with me to the doctor. To quote her later, uh, she would say, yeah, I drugged this whiny guy to the doctor because I was sick of putting up with his shit. <laughs> so, got into the doctor and talked to him about what was going on in my life. And Amber, in her uh, usual brevity, uh, after I got done, said, yeah, he needs to be put on an SSRI. And the doctor started asking me questions to make, you know, to, you know, I guess to ascertain uh, the nature of what was going on with me. And he asked me, have you ever thought about killing yourself? And I had to say yes with my friend there. And twice I had been close to doing that. And so he prescribed me an SSRI called citalopram. We got out of the doctor's office, and Amber, thankfully, was anticipating what was going through my head. Put the pill in my hand, had a bottle of water handy, and told me to take it. And I did. And I felt guilty, and I felt weak. But that stopped after about a week. I remember being at a LAN party down in Arkansas, and one of uh, the people there had brought in dip with sour cream, and I had a bite of it. It was delicious. And there was no panic. It was like breathing. It was easy. And that was a great year. Uh, that was the year we started work on Skepticon 3. I was full of energy. I was happy. I could get out of the house. It was like, it was literally like waking up from a nightmare. And it was glorious. And so time went on, and I got better, and things were good. But I noticed, um, I noticed that when I was taking these SSRIs, I was a little fuzzy. I, I couldn't uh, solve puzzles as well. I couldn't recall facts as quickly. And because I was doing debates and I was you know, doing some minor speaking and, and you know, general antagonism of religious people, um, that was kind of bugging me. And I had been on these things for a year and, and was better, and I was a bad skeptic and hadn't done my research, and I thought I was cured. And so I stopped taking them. And for about a year after that, things were good. I was in an excellent relationship. Um, I have, as I always had, a great family life. Everything in my life was wonderful. Of course, everything in my life was wonderful when this whole thing set in, which is kind of the nature of the beast. Most people who are clinically depressed don't really you know, have a reason to be clinically depressed. They just are. And then Skepticon 3 happened, and it kicked ass. And, um... Uh, Liz Liddell and the Secular Student Alliance, uh, Liz, who would go on to be my, my boss, um, offered me a job in the atheist movement with the Secular Student Alliance. And I thought about it for all of two seconds before accepting. Uh, and then in January, I moved to Columbus. If there was ever a time when a person could expect to be happy about life, I mean, that was it. I had my dream job. I was moving to a city. Uh, everything was perfect. And the thing is, there are, there are certain stressors in life that psychologists warn you and danger you for a relapse. New job, ending a relationship, and moving. Turns out to be three of the top four. Uh, was lucky enough to get away with, uh, without death of a loved one. Um, but the thing is, I didn't even know. I was so happy. Um, and two weeks after moving to take this job, just food started being a threat again. And so over the next month, I lost about, I don't know, 20 pounds. Got to the point where I had to leave work early. 
because I couldn't focus through the day. And it was the same thing as before. Everything I looked at sent me into a panic. And so I moved January the 3rd. And February 12th, I was back in the emergency room and back on new meds. A lot of bosses, I, I told Liz what was going on, and a lot of bosses would have decided to abandon that project immediately uh, as a liability, and Liz didn't. Liz held my hand. If any religious people get a hold of this video, my reputation is shot. <laughs> <laughs> Liz held my hand, and I called her that night and told her that I need my brain for what I do. I can't, I can't live with the fuzziness. And Liz, in all her wisdom, you know, told me, you know, you with a fuzzy brain is better than you not being able to get through the day, which you'd think I would have figured out, but I was pretty depressed. Uh, and so every day, uh, I gave her my bottle of uh, pills as I was... There was a voice in the back of my head, not an audible voice like prayer or anything, just a temptation. Swallow the whole thing. Which is bad. So I gave it to Liz, and every day when I got into work, there was one right there by my computer. So I started taking them again. And things got better. I got to eat again. But the thing about this condition is, and as I would later learn, and I should have learned if I'd have done my research sooner, is it's not like, um, it's not like having a cold. It's not something you get cured of. A serotonin deficiency in your brain is like an insulin deficiency in the rest of your body. It's not something that gets cured. It's something you manage. And when I stopped taking my pills, I was failing to manage it. But also, it can always jump up and bite you if you're not careful. And I wasn't careful. I got complacent. And in July of this year, I hit a particularly low spot that was worse than anything I'd ever been through with this. Our military tortures people because there's only so much people can take. There's only so much pain they can go through, and then they'll do anything. They'll tell you anything, they'll do anything just to make it stop. Our biology allows for nothing else. And I, I had to make it stop. It was keeping me from doing anything. And when you're in that kind of situation, you don't know. You don't always do its best. Sometimes you panic, and I panicked. I took my bottle of pills, and I emptied about half of them into my hand, and I swallowed them. Thankfully, there was a friend there who found me, and, you know, it's the thing about being depressed. You don't want to be a burden to anybody around you, so you try to conceal what's going on, which I was going into serotonin shock, so it's kind of hard, hard to disguise that. Um, but I was begging her not to go get a doctor. And thankfully, she ignored me. She's a good friend. Or she hates me, one of those two. <laughs> and I got to the hospital, and every single person I talked to was questioning me as though I had wanted to die. Why did you do that? Did you want to die? No. Why'd you do it then? And I didn't want to die. I just needed it to stop. And you might be looking at me saying, God, this guy's fucking nuts. Who else has this? And the answer is a significantly high portion of the population. <laughs> so how have I managed it since then? Um, my condition has transitioned. Whereas once I had uh, what's called anorexia nervosa, which is the difficulty in eating, uh, it's transitioned to anorexia athletica. I pretty much have to work out all the time. Um, recently, I, I had a particularly bad day where I went to the gym after a rough day at work and I exercised until I threw up. 
and then went back out and exercised until I threw up again. And the whole time, I just hear my therapist's voice in the back of my head saying, you know, this is, you know, stop. You need to stop this. This is bad. And you just can't make yourself sometimes. Why do these meds work? Actually, I have my life story on my laptop because I anticipated this might happen. How many people need a laptop presentation for their life story? You'd think I'd know the material. <laughs> you spend so much time fighting this because nobody wants to be crazy. There's such a stigma on it. Whereas if someone tells you, I have cancer, the response is always, oh, that sucks. But if you tell somebody, I see things that aren't there, or I can't make myself eat, a lot of times the response is, oh, you're crazy. Or, oh, why don't you just be better? And it doesn't work that way. <sighs> the drugs I'm on, why do they work? How do they work? In your brain, you have these cells called neurons. And the space between them is called the synapse. And you have these little chemicals that send the information back and forth between the neurons. It's what tells you you're tired. It's what tells you you're hungry. And it's what tells you whether or not you're happy or sad. And there are two neurotransmitters, serotonin and norepinephrine, that control, essentially, whether or not you're happy. And if you don't have enough of them in the synapse, you're just going to be unhappy. It doesn't matter how tough you are. It doesn't matter how good your life is. You're going to be unhappy. It's like not having enough insulin. And whereas nobody blames a single person for having diabetes, society has a tremendous tendency to blame people for lacking those two neurochemicals. And people die on account of it. So, why should this be an issue for the secular community, for the skeptic community? How many people in here are pissed about homeopathy? <laughs> and rightly so. It preys on people's gullibility, it maintains ignorance, and it prevents people from getting the proper medical attention they need for whatever ails them. I mean, we all know what happened to Steve Jobs. I mean, th this is not an isolated incident. But the exact same thing happens with people suffering from mental illness. There is this tremendous ignorance of the way the brain works in society at large. And this stigma on mental illness that not only keeps people like me from coming out of the closet, from getting the help we need to try and live something closer to normalcy, but something that kills us. It's like homeopathy on steroids. And it's something that skepticism would cure. I had so many points I want to bring up, and you know, I'm trying to sit up here and not be a pussy. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> with friends like mine. <laughs> oh, shucky darn. Um, We could be leading the way with this. You know, we oppose so many things that are anti-science. Religion, because it ends lives. We, um, we oppose psychics, because they, 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 uh, they bilk the gullible out of their money. This needs to be something we take on for ourselves. And I'll tell you why. Trying to make myself better by force of will, and trying to tough this thing out, was hell. And this is coming from a guy who's read the Bible four times and spent a year going to church to give a talk last year at Skepticon. I mean, it, it was hell. And um, I was never 
I never had a better day in my life than when I finally admitted to myself that I was crazy. Because it meant that it wasn't my fault. There was nothing I could have done. I was just sick. You know, but, but it is. It is. Um, I'll tell you something else uh, that I didn't even bring up. When I first got into exercise, I was killing myself. I was, I was working out you know, a couple hours a day, really watching my diet. And after every workout, I would look in the mirror, and I would think that I was getting heavier. I would literally see that I was getting heavier, even though I was going down belt notches. I, it, it was just so weird to me. And so I decided to start taking pictures to try and track my weight loss. And I noticed something. When I took a picture in my phone and held it up to the mirror, I would literally see two different images. And in summer this year, I got diagnosed with hallucinations on account of this. And nothing about admitting that I was crazy that was actually cool is then that got to be really, something really neat. It's like, I just wish I could show somebody that. It's so nifty. Um, but I am crazy. And the thing is, the, the knee-jerk reaction shouldn't be to say, no, I'm not crazy. It should be to tell society that being crazy is like having cancer. It's not their fault. And there's treatment available that can help people live something that is close to a real life that they're not getting because nobody knows this. I made a new friend when I moved to Columbus. Her name was Natasha. And she had been diagnosed with bipolar 2 when she was young. And she'd been on medication all her life. And she collected people in her life who had mental disorders. She thought it was nifty. Uh, for, Christmas, for Christmas last year, she bought all of her friends pill boxes. <laughs> Not joking. And so when in conversation it, it came up that I was a recovering anorexic, her immediate and honest response was, that's so cool. <laughs> and I thought she was out of her fucking mind. Like, mental illness is not something that's cool. It's something you manage. It's something you try to sunder from your personality. And that was in February, right before I went back to the emergency room. And at that conference, the American Atheist National Conference in April, um, when I gave a talk about coming out as an atheist, the last Sunday I was there, um, there was this woman there, her name was Katie, and I was walking along and she was, you know, giving one of these looks and kind of shuffling her feet, and then she does the charge up and says, hi, I'm like, hi, and she says, I've been trying to get the nerve up to talk to you all day, and I said, don't, and she said, I read your blog, and I'm a recovering anorexic too, and my immediate and honest reaction was, that's so cool. And I must have had the dumbest look on my face after I said that. She's like, are you okay? And I was like, and I had just realized how far I had come with this. And that is the reaction everybody needs to have. That is where everybody needs to be with this. For a lot of reasons. I lucked out in my experience and that I had exceptional friends who God, went to the ends of the earth and further to take care of me, even though I was a pain in the ass. And not everybody has that. We try to hide this condition because we don't want to be a burden to those close to us. Tell them we're busy. <laughs> um, and so we can't, we can't count on those close to us to make it readily apparent that they're sick. They're trying to de deny that they're sick, and they don't want to be a burden on you. You need to be looking for it. Because just like four people down here in the front row have a mental disorder, there are people in your life who have a mental disorder. And you may not even know it. And they need you. They don't only need you to drag them to the doctor and tell them that they're not weak, they're just sick. They also need you because of the myths about treatment, um, and because they'll need support. 
I want to talk about one particular myth of treatment before I get off the stage. And that myth in particular is that taking these medications for depression or for anorexia or for hallucinations or what have you, the SSRIs, will make you kill yourself. There is a movement in the United States going right now that is spreading this message. Not unlike the Catholic Church spreading the message in Africa that condoms cause AIDS. And it's wrong. Why is it wrong? SSRIs fix different aspects of your personality in time. Now, whereas when I was at bottom and I couldn't leave my room and I didn't want to work on anything, which is generally what happens with clinically depressed people, my SSRIs fix that, and it's the first thing that gets fixed. All of a sudden, you get your motivation back, and you want to run out and just take life by the horns and do everything you never got to do when you were trapped in your room. And the problem is that that part of the brain gets fixed before the depression side. And so we do actually have data that, that confirms that within the first few weeks of taking SSRIs, suicide rates do go up. But the thing is, that threat is always there. And it gets better after the first few weeks when the depression gets fixed. So if you're someone who doesn't suffer from a mental illness and you know somebody who's just gone on medication, don't fucking leave them. That is your job. And it's our job. <sighs> Not only is it your job to be there for them, it's your job as skeptics to go out into the community at large and tell people that there's nothing wrong with being insane. There's nothing wrong with being depressed. There's nothing wrong with being crazy. And that this horse shit about SSRI is making people kill themselves rather than keeping people from killing themselves is fucking wrong. It's not anti-scientific. It's not merely a matter of irrelevant opinion. It is fucking wrong. And it's not going to get fixed until the skeptics and the members of the secular movement and the people who have never had an appreciation for bullshit go out and start challenging it. And if there's anything you can take away from me this weekend, whether it was you know, this event that I had a hand in starting four years ago, whether it's you know, shaking your hand or, or just having a second to talk to you, you know, lay into religion, lay into homeopathy, lay into psychics, but lay into this, because there is a lot of suffering that happens because people aren't, and because society has no fucking clue about what people like me go through, and what people like 22 to 23% of everybody in this audience goes through. Be a friend, be an advocate, stop this. Thank you. What you said? I love that. That's fantastic. Thank you. Actually, give me give me another two seconds. Actually. Um, since I came out about this, um, man, I, I thought that there, there was going to be you know, rejection and you're crazy and ever since I went public with this. And there's been so many welcoming voices and people taking care of me. Uh, Sid Fisher is in the audience. She's been great. Uh, Michael and Ashley. I, I've, Elise. I've, I've met so many people who have been so good to me. So I know the capacity to fix that is in this movement. Otherwise, I wouldn't have given this talk. And thank you to all of you. I'm so grateful. You have no idea. Thank you.
okay. Uh, where's you bastard? <laughs> <clears throat> well, all right. Uh, skeptic. Well yeah. Uh, Skepticon four, everybody. Uh, okay. I'll see all you guys at Skepticon five, by the way. such a wild ride uh, since the beginning of Skepticon and this weekend has been amazing and I want to thank each and every one of you for coming here and making this happen. Without you guys we would just be a couple of assholes in a theater going woo! <laughs> so really thank you for coming out and I want to thank the speakers for also coming and hanging out with a bunch of kids from Springfield. Let's give it up for our speakers. And I wanna, I wanna point out a few volunteers. Blythe, our stage manager, for making sure everything went smoothly. Blythe, wherever you are, thank you. And I wanna thank Rob, our cameraman, for making sure that all of this can get on YouTube so anybody can watch it anywhere. Thank you, Rob. And where the hell is Katie Hartman? Because I want, yes. Thank you for making this year happen. This woman made sure that Skepticon 4 happened. Give it up for Katie. It's all you. And, and before we go, you know, if support events like this, make events like this, donate to our cause. Buy a calendar, I'm totally in it. Buy a poster, buy a pen, it's a dollar. I know you have a dollar. Go out there, spread the message of awesomeness. Thank you. <laughs>